we will take our reading from St. John's Apocalypse. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. And the woman brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with with an iron rod. And her son was taken up to God and to his throne. Again, words taken from St. John's Apocalypse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On New Year's Eve in the year 1916, a party was held in honor of a very wicked man. This evil man had falsely portrayed himself as a Christian, a holy monk, in fact. And as a result of this wolf in sheep's clothing, he had gained power within the royal family of Russia. The leaders of this empire, the Tsar and his wife, the Tsarina, were completely taken in by this supposed holy man whose name was Rasputin, especially because he had powers, magical powers, that could heal their son and future Tsar of Russia who suffered from hemophilia. And so whenever there was an episode of bleeding, Rasputin would be called in to save the little boy from bleeding to death. He could never fully heal the boy, couldn't do a miracle, but somehow he could miraculously stop the flow of blood. Rasputin's evil influence over the royal family of Russia, along with the horrible effects of World War I, were destroying that poor country and threatening the survival of the dynasty of the Tsar. Now that New Year's Eve party was actually a trap set for Rasputin, the food and drink given to this false monk, were heavily laced with doses of cyanide. But as they fed Rasputin more and more poison, they found him completely unaffected. Next, the friends of the Tsar and the patriots of Russia would try guns. They shot Rasputin right through the heart. He fell, but there was no blood, and he continued to breathe. And within minutes, Rasputin jumped up, and began to roar and behave like a beast. And as he began his escape through a side door, four more shots rang out. One hit Rasputin in the neck, and right through another one right through the shoulder. And soon the assassins found that he was still alive. So they began to beat him with their canes, with furniture, anything they could find. But he remained alive. It was almost as if he couldn't die. Finally, they wrapped up Rasputin in a large curtain, and threw him into an icy cold river. And as he flowed down that river, Rasputin's head was cut open when it hit a bridge column. The next morning, the body was found completely encased in ice. But strangely enough, strangely enough, the lungs of the body were filled with water, and his arm was reaching upward, showing that Rasputin had still been alive in the water, trying to escape and to breathe. The Catholic historian, Dr. Warren Carroll, claims that Rasputin was most likely possessed by demons and that there was never a clear example of demonic possession affecting the course of human events. Furthermore, that great Irish priest and lover of Christ the King, Father Dennis Fahey, claimed that Rasputin was recruited by Freemasonry and literally bankrolled by revolutionary groups in order to bring disorder to Russia and to topple the Tsar from his throne. What followed after Rasputin's death was the assassination of the Tsar, his wife, and all their children. A Christian nation with a certain Christian order where Christ reigned would soon become an atheistic one when the Bolsheviks took control in the year 1917. The Communist Revolution and the rise of a godless and Christless culture is considered the most important secular event of the 20th century. But during the exact same year, 1917, just months before the Russian Revolution, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared at a place called Fatima, Portugal, to three shepherd children 
in a little valley called the Kova Dayira. The mother of God spoke to a 10-year-old girl named Lucia, as well as her two cousins, a 9-year-old boy named Francisco and a 7-year-old girl named Jacinta, all on the 13th day of the month between May and October of 1917. The Queen of Heaven, and yes, the Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, provided a formula, a formula for true peace, a saving prescription that would bring about the triumph of her immaculate heart, and yes, the reign of Christ the King in the hearts of men and in the public societies of nations. To three shepherd children the Virgin then spoke, a message so hopeful of peace for all folk. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. Well, this formula, this formula for peace and the triumph of Jesus, Mary, and Holy Church began with the recitation of the Most Holy Rosary. The Queen instructed her three little subjects, say the rosary every day in order to obtain peace for the world and an end to the war. Furthermore, she encouraged them to do penances, to make sacrifices for sinners that they might be saved from the fires of hell. And Our Lady also spoke about her special role in crushing Satan's unjust tyranny. The key to true peace and human salvation was devotion to Our Lady, a consecration, in fact, of Russia and every single human person to her immaculate heart. Through Mary's queenship over all hearts and all nations, her triumphant reign, Christ's kingship will be present both in the interior life of men and in the public life of nations. Because where Mary is truly queen, Jesus is king. Well, on July 13, 1917, the three loyal subjects of the queen would have a third audience. But this apparition proved to be a dire warning, which included a horrible vision of hell itself, which was filled with countless souls. It wasn't empty. If the queen's formula for peace were not followed, many souls would be damned. And an even worse war would follow with greater sufferings, and it would be experienced during the pontificate of Pope Pius XI, the Pope of Christ the King. Our Lady stated to the seers, quote, If you suddenly see a bright unknown light one night, know that this is a sign from God which he is giving you to let you know that he is going to punish the world for its sins. Yes, a bright light in the middle of the night. This light in the night sky, reported by all major newspapers, did occur in Europe, by the way, in the year 1938, just days before Adolf Hitler took over the country of Austria in what is called the Anschluss. That soon would bring the Second World War and the continued stubborn resistance of men within the world and within Holy Church to enact the formula for order and peace would lead to the spread of Russia's revolutionary errors, bringing greater chaos and disorder to mankind. In other words, the continued rejection of Christ's kingship and Mary's reign as queen would mean their further absence and withdrawal leaving men to suffer the horrible consequences. Well, after being put, on, put in jail by, by a Masonic and socialist Portuguese official during the month of August, the children would visit with the Mother of God three more times, including a final visit in October of 1917. And to prove that Our Lady had truly visited her loyal subjects and that her message was real and was to be followed, a miracle from heaven was provided for all to see that would rival and, yes, truly surpass the parting of the Red Sea by Moses. The children knelt to pray the Most Holy Rosary during this time, and their queen was present as well, and there was a torrential downpour 
at the Cobra Dyer, rain and soaking mud everywhere. But then all of a sudden, Lucia, Francisco, Jacinta, and some 70,000 witnessed a supernatural and almost cataclysmic event. Allow me, if you will, to read a description of the miracle written in a Portuguese revolutionary and Masonic newspaper known for its hatred of Catholicism. This was an atheistic newspaper that hated the church. The chief editor of that paper wrote, quote, We saw the huge crowd turn towards the sun at its zenith. It resembled a flat plate of silver, and it was possible to stare at it without the least bit discomfort. Before the dazzled eyes of the people, the sun began to tremble. It made strange and abrupt movements. Outside of all cosmic laws, the sun danced, unquote. Eventually, all these witnesses tell us that the sun raced towards the earth as if to crash into it, but it then returned to its original spot. Not only were the people now safe from harm, but they found that all their rain-soaked and mud-stained clothes were totally dry and clean. And the muddy ground around them was now completely dry. Well, to begin this mission conference, I read to you from the Apocalypse of St. John about a woman, a woman that is clothed with the sun and how she is crowned. She is crowned with 12 stars as queen of heaven and earth, of the apostles and of all men, as Christ was the son of David so Mary is a daughter of King David and a member of the royal house of Judah. She would conceive and give birth to him who is the one who is given the throne of David his father, to him who is the king over the house of Jacob forever, to him whose kingdom shall have no end. As King Solomon of old reverenced his own mother, Queen Bathsheba, and seated her on a throne to his right and granted her every request, so the ultimate king of wisdom and prince of peace, Christ the king, has placed his own mother upon a heavenly throne, and her intercession is omnipotent. Wherever Christ is king by right and by conquest, Mary is queen by grace and by participation in that conquest. As the mother of God and the mother of our king, Mary shares in the universal kingship of Jesus himself, for the Almighty has done great things for her, and holy is her name. And yes, as St. Thomas Aquinas taught, certainly a figure of authority, St. Thomas Aquinas taught that Our Lady has a certain, quote-unquote, infinite dignity. And Pope Pius XII only confirmed this statement of St. Thomas when he wrote, It cannot be doubted. That Mary Most Holy is far above all creatures in dignity and after her son possesses primacy over all creation. Her reign extends even to the demons themselves who are obliged to recognize her power. For she can command that their temptations cease. She can save souls from their snares. And yes, she can repulse their attacks and they must kneel before her. The wonder Holy Church then has called her the Hail Holy Queen enthroned above and their music, the Salve Regina, the Ave Regina Caelorum, and the Regina Caeli, always queen, always the mother of the king. But as you know, in the same Bible passage I read, there is made mention the red dragon, the reptile, the serpent. You know, the God of peace, and he is a God of peace, the God of peace and reconciliation has only established one enemy relationship in creation. And he did so at the very beginning. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God spoke, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman. I will create an enemy relationship between the serpent's seed, his offspring, and the woman's offspring. That enmity is obviously between Mary and the devil, between the queen and the unjust usurper, between her true subjects 
and the offspring and, yes, revolutionaries of Satan. This is an irreconcilable feud, and it will last until the end of time. And, dear people, it will only increase in intensity as the years pass. Hear that. That enemy relationship will only increase in intensity as each year passes. Case in point, Sister Lucia, again, one of the visionaries of Fatima who became a Carmelite nun, as you know, Sister Lucia stated back in 1957, not that long ago, she said, quote, the most holy virgin has told me that the devil is about to engage in a decisive battle against the virgin, unquote. In short, the devil wants what? He wants to desire and delay and even thwart the triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart. He wants to end her reign as queen of all nations and her dominion over individuals, as well as to quash any hope for a certain age of peace which we so desperately need as men. What is the triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart? What is this triumph that we pray for? What is this triumph of her heart that we go to those first Saturday Masses for and seek to remove those those thorns from her Immaculate Heart? What is this triumph? It is a certain age of peace in the reign of Christ the King. It is a universal reestablishment of the Christian order or what is called Christendom. The triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart is simply the triumph of Christ the King. His universal reign in the in the minds, hearts, and public societies of all men. His gospel being the law of nations on this earth. Coriesu adveniat regnum tuum adveniat per Maria. Heart of Jesus, may your kingdom come and may it come through Mary. Or as St. Louis Marie de Montfort, the great priest and slave of our Blessed Mother, once said, it was through the Most Holy Virgin that Jesus came into the world, and it is only through the Virgin that he has to reign in this world. Now, I'm well aware that things look very dark in this modern age, but things are darkest in nature always, just before the rising sun. Mary is that morning star. You see her most days, at least in symbol, on the planet Venus. She announces always the dawn of the day of the Lord. Although there very well may be a chastisement put upon mankind, there will also come a restoration period, the reign of Jesus and Mary, and a certain age of peace. And those subjects most devoted to the Queen of Heaven and Earth will be the special instruments in this restoration. Again, St. Louis Marie de Montfort, the great slave of Our Lady, prophesied about the apostles of those latter days who will strike down the devil and his followers. According to Montfort, these holy followers of Queen Mary will carry the crucifix in their right hand, the rosary in their left And they will have the names of Jesus and Mary upon their hearts. And with one hand, they will give battle. And they will crush all heretics and their heresies. They will overthrow all schismatics and their schisms. And they will overthrow all sinners and their wickedness. But with the other hand, they will build the temple of the true Solomon, Christ's kingdom. And they will build up the mystical city of God, which is the Blessed Mother. These great apostles of those latter days, which many saints have spoken about, will be given the great privilege. And what a privilege it will be to be part of Our Lady's heel, which will one day come down upon the head of the serpent. And that is why the devil fears Our Lady and her subjects more than he fears God himself. Say it again. The devil fears Our Lady and her subjects more than he fears God himself. Satan knows his time is short, 
And he knows that the queen's heel is about to come down. It is prophesied and it must happen. See, if God directly crushed Satan, the devil could keep his pride. Since he lost to the creator himself, I took on the best I lost. But when the instrument of his fall, his demise, is a humble little virgin from Nazareth, can anything good come out of that town? And yes, when part of the instrument of his downfall is people like us, lowly servants, the devil's humiliation is complete. He was defeated by a woman, and he's defeated by human persons, the likes of us. The formula for crushing the head of the serpent, as well as the prescription for bringing about a time of restoration and peace, has already been given to us. And it begins with the recitation of the most holy rosary. In St. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, the great apostle speaks about that person I mentioned earlier, the Antichrist. This malicious individual will come towards the end of time and will seek to usurp, to wrongly take Christ's rightful throne. And as I mentioned at first conference, the Antichrist will be known as the man of sin. The Antichrist will be the combination of all those evil prefigurements or types. Men like Nero, Caligula, Julian the Apostate, Muhammad, Frederick II, Martin Luther, Hitler, Stalin. All of them combined and more. But then St. Paul mentions that this great enemy is presently chained up and he is restrained, held back. The apostle writes, you know what restrains him until he shall be revealed in his own time. The secret force of the Antichrist is already at work. The spirit is already there, mind you. But there is one who holds him back until that restrainer is taken from the scene. Now, St. Paul obviously told the Thessalonians just who or what is the restrainer that holds back the devil and the Antichrist. Traditionally, the fathers of the church say, traditionally, the restrainer was seen as the Gentile nations, nations like the Roman Empire of old, and their occupation of Israel, which prevented the rise of the man of sin. The Holy Land, as you well know, have been taken away from the Jews by God himself because of their rejection of Jesus. The devil and his puppet needed to have that obstacle removed and an end to the Gentile occupation. Because what does the Antichrist long for? He wants to be hailed as the king of Israel. He wants to be seen as the Messiah. And revolutionary Jews, Zionists, have always looked for a movement, for some leader to follow, to change the order of things. In St. Ho John's Holy Gospel, our dearest Lord prophesied as he spoke to the Jews saying, I come in the name of my Father and you will not receive me, but if another come in his own name, him you will receive. A prophecy of their acceptance of the Antichrist. Well, with the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948 and the Israelis occupying Jerusalem in 1967, no wonder many have asked, including Popes Pius X and Pius XII, whether the reign of the Antichrist was actually very near. But others have suggested the restrainer is actually the Pope, the Vicar of Christ. Some have pointed out that perhaps it is the holy sacrifice of the Mass the great bastion that protects us from the full onslaught of the evil one. And this may well be true, since the Antichrist will suppress the mass, as the Bible clearly states. But I would like to add a final thing. Devotion to Mary and her most holy rosary is a powerful means to restrain evil and to lead the elect towards holiness and salvation and to promote the reign of Jesus and Mary. The great priest, the great priest and teacher of the young, St. John Bosco, was also an individual who received from God many dreams and private messages. 
Well, Don Bosco once had a vision of a poisonous serpent that had been let loose in a dream. The situation was serious. The serpent was very dangerous and was roaming about looking for someone to bite. But then Don Bosco noted that at the recitation of the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary, there was a chain that formed that utterly wrapped around the snake and restrained him. Yes, that angelic salutation of the Hail Mary restrained the adversary. And the Holy Rosary made up of 150 Hail Marys is truly a chain that restrains evil. It is a powerful sling with decades of small stones that bring down the Goliaths of this world. Or as the great Capuchin friar Padre Pio once stated, the Holy Rosary is a weapon. The great artist Michelangelo also knew the power of the rosary. He's famous for his paintings, his frescoes, and statuary. But one of his most famous pieces is that final judgment scene behind the main altar in the Sistine Chapel. If you look closely at that famous mural of Christ the Judge, you will see an angel near the Blessed Mother dangling a holy rosary towards one of the elect below so that he may grab onto it, hold it, and be lifted up towards salvation by that saving cord. The holy rosary is not just a weapon. It is also a ladder. It's Jacob's ladder, and it's leading us upward towards perfection and eternal life. The holy rosary is perfect prayer. It's a perfect prayer for human beings with bodies and souls. You see, the rosary activates. We know this. It activates nearly every part of man. It's a vocal prayer. It is both spoken and it is also heard. It is truly a mental prayer in which the mysteries of the Holy Gospel are meditated upon. And yes, it is even a tangible prayer where the body is involved in touching and fingering the beads. The Holy Rosary, therefore, is a truly Christian prayer. It's incarnational. It's a heavenly prayer that touches both body and soul. It's a sacramental of the church that provides countless occasions for grace if it is but prayed. For some, then, the Rosary will be that saving rope that will help them climb to the mountain of God. It will be a lifeline which will help the fallen sinner as well. But for others, especially for the devil and his crew, the rosary will be that scourge that beats down the foe, a chain that restrains the adversary, and yes, a noose that hangs our enemies. The holy rosary, dear people, has great power. Power to restrain evil, power to convert sinners, power to lift up the fallen, power to chain up and bind the serpent. And I guarantee you here and now, if you pray the Holy Rosary on a daily basis, you will be lifted up to heaven one day. If all Christian people in this country would pray the Rosary daily, there would be that age of peace. Russia would be consecrated and, yes, converted to the Catholic faith. The devil and his offspring with their ungodly agenda would be defeated. The rosary, as history tells us, would defeat far more Muslims than drone strikes. That heavenly dew of divine grace would saturate the very soil of this nation and the Western world until a new Christendom emerged with all things restored in Christ the King and Mary the Queen. This is the power of the Holy Rosary. Don't let the only time you hold the rosary be when you're in your coffin. Pick up the rosary and pray it. It is a key ingredient for the formula of peace and restoration given by the Blessed Mother herself. As Pope Blessed John XXIII once said, the only bad rosary is the one that wasn't prayed. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.